I'm really pleased to introduce today uh, Agalos Kiyas, who is um, the Chair in Cybersecurity and Privacy at the University of Edinburgh and um, the Chief Scientist at IOHK. And IOHK is the company that's contract to design, build, and maintain the Cardano blockchain. And Agelos is, um, has received an NSF Career Fellowship, a Fulbright Fellowship, and is a member of the Royal Society of Edinburgh. And he has over 150 um, publications, mostly in computer science and cryptography, with over 10,000 citations. And today he's going to be talking to us about rethinking information technology from a decentralization perspective. So, um, Jealous, um, please go ahead. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Brett. Um, thank you very much for the invitation and the kind introduction. Um, I'm very happy, actually, to uh, be with you here. Um, and uh, let's get right ahead with the uh, topic uh, that I have prepared for you. So the, let me start with a question. The main question uh, that motivates the angle that I've taken to uh, discuss today's topic is how do we scale an IT service globally? So we are at the time that we want to understand how is it possible to produce scalable IT services that can reach everyone. So how is it possible to do that? Now, if I may point out, there's two, if you want to call them classical ways of doing that. And I'm using here Vint Cerf and Mark Zuckerberg as uh, the, uh, Two examples of people that very successfully led uh, instances of those models. So the centralized model, of course, on the right, uh, is uh, capable of scaling at the global level uh, and offer excellent quality of service. So we see many examples of that, Facebook, Google, Amazon, very successful companies uh, that are capable of uh, uh, servicing people at the global level. Now, on the other hand, the internet itself is a different type of uh, operation. Uh, so the internet itself is, is a global IT service, uh, but it's a federated system. And these systems also can scale, perhaps even much more robustly than centralized systems, but they require a lot of work to solve coordination issues and interoperability between all the participating entities. So they need this uh, governance and coordination layer to help them get to that level. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done, let's say, in the real world, outside of the system, uh, in order for them to get to get to that level. And of course, uh, in both cases, we can identify cases where things go badly. So in a centralized system, obviously, the controlling entity can just nurture to its own self-interest, neglecting the common good. Shareholder corporations, um, after all, do not necessarily um, have the best interest of the population they serve, they have the interest of the shareholders. And, and when this happens, due to regulatory arbitrage, it can be very difficult uh, for the public to have any leverage uh, against the corporation. And we've seen many examples of this going, uh, going badly, uh, especially during the last two decades. On the other hand, uh, things can go badly in federated systems as well. I mean, first of all, achieving the coordination that is needed between the different layers of governance for a federated system is difficult. So it is even possible that the federated system may not even launch. I mean, the efforts that are needed, let's say, in standardization, uh, in bringing all the different parties together so that they figure out the uh, uh, common uh, way of interoperating between the uh, different systems that have been developed by different actors can take years of hard effort. So it's possible actually that the federated system may, may not even launch. And even if it launches, it is possible that its processes can become distorted or ineffective, leading eventually to fragmentation or even uneven access to services something that leads to the users of the system being dissatisfied and the system becoming unstable. And here's a dissatisfied user, let's say, of the, of the federal, uh, of the federated system of the US government. 
So is there another way? So it's interesting to explore um, uh, different ways that we can scale IT systems globally. And what's very interesting is that with the development of the Bitcoin system, Satoshi Nagamoto's contribution, we have now a third option in our arsenal for scaling IT services, and this is decentralization. So let's look at the Bitcoin system from this angle. Let's forget a bit about the cryptocurrency or the investment and all that. Let, let's think about it as a pure IT service. It is global. It offers a consistent database of transactions. And the maintainers are incentivized to service new transactions and keep the database consistent. Now, interestingly, the system has exhibited stability for over a decade of operation without having a centralized setup or a single supporting organization. And in fact, during this decade, there's many negative things that have happened in the, in the world of Bitcoin. For example, the, the system split some years ago, uh, the system was banned a number of times in different countries. Despite that fact, the system still keeps going. And participation at times even grew exponentially since the launch of the system. So the question here is that, is there something to learn here from its successful deployment? How can we um, extract a paradigm for IT services by looking at the Bitcoin system? And here is an attempt that I outline in this position paper uh, that I give you a tiny URL link to it. And it's on the website of the blockchain lab at Edinburgh. Um, that uh, uh, hosts all the research that me and my team are doing at the university. So resource-based systems have four main characteristics. And so this is an abstraction of the Bitcoin approach as a general paradigm for global IT services. So the first characteristic on the upper left is resource-based participation. There is some fungible resource that can be acquired by anyone interested in doing so. Entities in possession of units of this resource can exercise it in some way, and they can participate in the maintenance of the service, possibly incurring some costs while doing so. On the top right is what I call tokenomics. That's a portmanteau word between token and economics. So for tokenomics, the uh, key component of the system is a digital asset or currency that the system issues and uses that to tokenize the collective efforts of the maintainers. So these digital coins are maintained in a cryptographic wallet and in some way, they should offer or should be of sufficient utility to the maintainers to make their engagement worthwhile in a joint sense. So jointly, if you look at all of them, all these resource holders, it should make sense for them to engage. And, and the digital asset that is tokenizing their efforts by the system should make it so. Now, actually, it's interesting to point out here that resource-based participation is more of a cryptographic and domain technology issue, depending on the nature of the resource, whereas the tokenomics aspect is, a, is an economics question. Now, if I move to the lower left, the third component of a, a resource-based system is decentralized service provision. Now, this is the protocol design part. So th this is how the system implements the service that it's supposed to, it's supposed to offer. The user should be able to interact with the service by submitting a transaction, which is then openly circulated in the network of maintainers. Now, transactions in order to be circulated should be satisfy a certain concept of well-formedness. For instance, it could be the case that the users commit some uh, digital currency uh, together with their transaction. The maintainers then collectively will take the required actions that are needed and the submitted transactions will be processed and they should be processed in a consistent 
an expedient fashion. So this is part of the challenge for designing a protocol for doing that. Furthermore, and importantly, when we do the service provision, the system should be able to record the efforts of the maintainers. And finally, in the lower right is the fourth component, which is reward sharing. And this would be the game theoretic component of the system. So the digital assets that the system makes available to the maintainers should be somehow distributed to those that are active in a way which is regular and fair so that the system's safety, but as well as liveness properties, they should emanate from their incentive-driven participation. So any property violation here should uh, be a deviation from an equilibrium state. And any such deviation should incur some cost to the perpetrators so that the system is stable. So let's now take a closer look at each of these four characteristics. Let me start with resource-based participation. Now, this relies on some primitive or scheme that is called the proof of resource. In most cases, this can be a cryptographic primitive. I call it, in short, POX, as proof of X, where X is the resource in question. And two of the most commonly used uh, resources in protocol design and uh, today is work and stake. Now, proof of work here actually means proof of computational power. It has the characteristic that the cost of it is proportional to the resource that, uh, that you possess, the units of resource. So if you have like, more computational power, you may have to spend more energy in order to demonstrate that. And there are many interesting aspects in the design of this primitive. Some of the difficulties that have been encountered in the, in the space since the beginning of the use of proof of work in the context of systems like Bitcoin is that hardware-based optimizations, they can distort the resource space. So what happens is that if you take a particular proof of work algorithm, this may not be, let's say, representative of uh, you having computational power, but it's more about being representative of you being able to execute that particular algorithm very fast. This actually gave rise to um, hardware optimizations and devices, let's say in Bitcoin, that execute Bitcoin's proof of work very fast, creating a lot of other issues such as electronic waste, uh, as well as making sort of regular operators or interested maintainers that do not possess these devices incapable of contributing as system maintainers. Now, another issue also that is quite important, especially these days uh, for proof of work is the energy waste or the energy expenditure, if you want, that the system incurs. As it is right now, the Bitcoin protocol might consume something about 0.5% according to some metrics of the total energy expenditure. And of course, questions rise, Ray, questions are, have been reason about whether this is, is sensible or is a, um, is a good use of, of energy, especially at the time when we want to promote energy sources that are renewable. The fact of the matter is that the Bitcoin protocol itself, as well as other proof of work protocols, are not capable of um, you know, selecting energy sources because they just focus on the computational effort component. In part, as a response to this, uh, proof of stake was early on proposed uh, in the blockchain community. The main difference here is that the uh, stake is a virtual resource uh, and thus proving that you possess it is something that's independent of the number of units of that resource that you possess. Now, there are other issues for proof of stake, for example, the nothing at stake issue that basically says that since it's so easy for you to produce a proof of stake, why would you not just do that in violation of the protocol rules to somehow confuse other players 
and impact the security or liveness of the network. And this is another issue that has to be resolved whenever someone would use proof of stake in a system like that. Now, this being said, these are just two examples, and there are many more that have been explored. For example, space or di disk storage is another one, as well as elapsed time, which is a virtual resource of just time. And this is provided by uh, trusted platform modules, specifically in the SGX, that can give you this same sort of operation as you would get from proof of work, but without the cost. Of course, coming with a trust on the underlying hardware. Now, there are many interesting research questions around designing proof of X primitives or protocols for resource based participation. Uh, one general requirement, if I may point it out, is the uh, freshness requirement that we want these proofs to be fresh. So it should be impossible for, let's say, a bad actor to replay old proofs. And there are many interesting uh, properties uh, to uh, understand in order to design these schemes correctly. And I'll just mention a few of them in the context of proof of work. One of them is called amortization resistance, which basically says that you don't want to have any speed ups when you have an adversary that tries to perform a lot of these proofs at the same time. You want these proofs to have a parameter that adjusts their hardness. So they have this moderate hardness uh, feature. And for blockchain-like operation, so for systems that use them for blockchains, we also want this symmetry breaking, uh, this symmetry breaking um, capability that basically says that if you start doing this proof of work, and there are two independent uh, operators trying to do this at the same time they will not finish together. So there has to be some variance in the way that they execute and uh, succeed in producing this proof. So the symmetry breaking is essentially for some of these protocols to operate properly. Um, so can I ask you a Go question ahead. about that? Um, in the proof of stake section, you mentioned that um, the proof of stake is independent of uh, the, the proof cost is independent of the amount of stake. And so that's true, I guess, at a like at a cryptographic level to for the chain to validate that you have so much stake, right? That mm -hmm. that's the same no matter how much stake you have. But I thought it basically a, a fundamental idea of proof of stake is that there's some opportunity cost to staking so that there is some sort of your real world cost of staking is proportional to the amount you stake. Um, is that how does that play into this sort of? That's absolutely right. Um, it's just that in that previous slide, when I talked about cost, I meant like in the sense of energy spent or in okay. terms yep. of, um, so I'll, I'll come to issues like the one you say a bit a bit later on. I mean, these are, these are important considerations, uh, but I was just referring to cost in terms of, let's say, raw computational step, let's say as a computer scientist, for example, would, yep. would okay. approach this as an algorithm. Sure. All right, thank you. Um, so here are some resource examples uh, that have been used in some systems that uh, use them, and examples for power, computational power, storage, or, or stake. And now let me move on to the second aspect, which is the um, tokenomics part. And it addresses the point, okay, there is a way to demonstrate resource-based participation but do you want to do it? Do you want to engage with it? Does it make economic sense that you engage with such a, such a system? So for this purpose, uh, resource-based systems, they have these digital coins or digital assets that are issued by the system. And the objective is that somehow these assets should influence the utility of the maintainers so that engaging to the, with the system is, a, is attractive. And there are a few ways that we can come up with uh, such tokenomics uh, uh, sort of schedules or tokenomics uh, mechanisms. I'll describe one, which I call the market-based one. It's the one that's used in Bitcoin and it's by far the, the most common. And the idea is that the system issues these digital coins. The digital coins tokenize the efforts of the maintainers, so the maintainers get those coins. The maintainers can sell the, those coins in an open market and then they uh, receive um, 
payment for that. This is something that they can use to offset their cost. And then the users, they when they want to transact with the system, they will issue uh, an input to the system that commits these digital coins. And then you can think of this process as repeating in some way. Of course, this is a very, very high level view of how this can be. And this can be done. And someone will have to go into more detail and understand and design exactly the schedule with which these digital assets would come and have some understanding about you know, what would be the demand um, of the service. So obviously the demand of the service and the way that this impacts the cost of the system, the collective cost, let's say, for all the maintenance, should be somehow countered by this utility increase that, that we said. For example, like the maintenance re receiving payments for that. So, so what we want to always argue here is that there is enough profit made by the maintainers so that the suitable level of quality of service uh, offered remains attractive. Now, this is a market-based approach, which I should say has potentially other advantages too. For instance, it allows an open market of the digital coin of the system to engage with speculators who might um, want to uh, assess a particular system's current value or future value. And this is also something that could be very useful as a signal about whether the system is perceived as useful or not. Now, this is a market-based approach, but I should say there's other ways that someone can think to, about the tokenomics of a system. So someone, for example, could say, okay, there's no need for a market. Perhaps people can do that for reputation. And in that case, the digital asset of the system could signify, let's say, uh, the reputation points that someone can enter, uh, can, can earn for, for performing the system maintenance tasks. So, let me move now to the third um, component or the third characteristic of a resource-based system, which is this decentralized service provision. So, so this is the protocol design part. Well, whatever we want to do or whatever service we want to offer, uh, we have to design a protocol for it. We want to implement this over an open network and in a decentralized manner. And here, decentralized basically means that we cannot use identities. So the only thing that we can use to let people engage with this protocol is this proof of resource. So this is where we have to utilize this proof of resource in some sensible manner. So the challenge is here, obviously, uh, starting with denial of service, if it's an open network, we have to have some way to prevent the system from getting um, a hit with denial of service attacks. And transaction fees uh, is a way in market-based economics that we can, we can use to mitigate uh, such denial of service attacks. Uh, other properties or challenges that we have to meet is consistency. It should be the case that uh, the system processes transaction in some sort of consistent manner, network-wide. So it shouldn't be the case that when a certain input is given to the system, there is some parts of the network that experience you know outcome a and some other parts of the network experience outcome b of that input right so it should be the case that the system is inconsistent uh, has an inconsistent is in an inconsistent state and finally lightness suggests that the system should process transactions in a timely manner without censoring them now, a final point, which is very important and crucial in this protocol design, and it's also unique in these resource-based systems, is that we have to facilitate in some way the fair recording of the system maintainer efforts. This means that we have to have some performance metric and make the system and, ma and make these metrics resilient, even against what's called in computer science and distributed system design isn't in adversaries. So basically, if you engage as a system maintainer, I should be able, or the system should be able to record your efforts, even if there is a coalition that is against you and tries to manipulate these metrics to your disadvantage. 
That's very important because in the game theoretic uh, analysis of the system, if we do not have these robustness properties, we're going to run into trouble. And some examples from the ledgers in the Bitcoin blockchain, the metric which is being used, which is the number of blocks on, on the chain, is known to be not a very robust performance metric. In fact, we know uh, from the work of Eyal and Sear that selfish mining attacks exploiting that demonstrate that um, the system itself cannot be in equilibrium because of these deviations. Other approaches, such as the work on Euroboros, which I've worked a few years ago, it uses a different way, a different type of performance uh, metrics that we can prove that are resilient to manipulation. And this actually gives rise to better equilibria property for the underlying protocol. Now let's move to the fourth aspect, which is reward sharing. And this is the part that I'm going to spend a bit more time on. The question is, how do you turn a set of self-organizing resource holders to a set of well-functioning system maintainers without anyone centrally organizing them or taking decision? So the goal is to distribute the rewards, some rewards fairly, at regular intervals. And maybe we can look at the every action and we can reward every good action, let's say. Um, so if you do an action that is consistent and is good for the system, we reward you. For example, the Bitcoin blockchain takes this approach. As you issue a block, I'm going to reward you. I'm going to give you some Bitcoin. I'm going to give you some transaction fees. Other, other protocols, for example, like the Roboros protocol used in Cardano, as well as uh, other systems, they take an epoch-based approach. They say, at regular intervals, I'm going to look at the state of the system. I'm going to look at these performance metrics that I've collected, and I try to make a optimal split of the rewards that I have. So the desired properties of the system should emanate at an equilibrium state out of the incentive-driven participation of the entities, and we want the system to convert to good equilibrium. So what is a good equilibrium now? I'll come a bit more to that point. So let's uh, consider the following. It's a resource-based system. There are no identities. So it is possible for, uh, to have this mixed operation. Let's call it pure versus pooled operation. In pure operation, let's say at a certain snapshot of time, everybody has a certain amount of resources. And the pure operation says that everyone participates with the resources they possess, just directly. Of course, you understand that this may not be very attractive. For instance, in Bitcoin, you may have a laptop, but you don't, which is, if you want, a resource unit, but probably not worth your while to start mining. So in pooled operation, what happens is that participants pool resources together to, fall, to form these multi-participant entities or pools. You know, this is important from a security perspective. So security in these resource-based systems relies on a sufficient number of resource holders following the protocol. And in fact, the system can lose its liveness and safety properties when a cartel of entities control more than a certain percentage of the resource. For many of these designs, you can actually prove quite general results about this, that if someone controls 51% of the resources, then bad things will happen. Uh, in the basic properties, in the basic safety and liveness properties of the underlying system. So, for example, a cartel of these entities can decide to revert transactions or censor transactions. So let's get then to the business of how do we design rewards functions taking, that must take into account the fact that we have this pooling operation. So a reward function, let's take this, uh, um, let's denote it by row here, uh, is the function that's going to take a um, pool of resources and will assign a certain amount of rewards to that. And while let's take sigma to be a metric, a measure of resources, let's use a notation of omega for the universe of all resource units labeled by the owner of the unit, so let's say at particular 
snapshot of time. And the metric, the measure function sigma would be one for omega and zero for the empty set. So the question we want to explore is like how we design a good reward function and, and what is a bad equilibrium. So let's start with some axioms and properties of these reward functions that have been explored, not explicitly as I'm making here, but I'm distilling here some basic principles that have been discussed a lot in the, in the blockchain community. So the first one says continuity is a pretty natural. So the reward function is a sort of continuous over this set of resource units. Fungibility basically says that if you have, let's say, an X amount of resources, it doesn't matter where they are or who you are. If you have an X amount of resources, you're going to get the same rewards. So the resources are fungible, these resource units. Now, civil resilience basically says the following. Suppose you have a, um, two operators, you have like two separate pools. And if you split them, you're not going to be making more rewards. So basically, this says that if you have a certain amount of resources, it's not going to be to your advantage to split them and behave like you are two people, like two participants. So this is called civil resilience for that reason. We want so these reward schemes try to de-incentivize the splitting. Egalitarianism, on the other hand, says something of the opposite direction. It basically says that if you have two people um, and then you have a someone that has the sum of their resources, he's not going to be making uh, more rewards. So it's like someone who is rich is not going to be making more than let's say two people that have half their wealth. So these are some natural actions. And interestingly, the moment you assume those actions, which seems quite natural, you're going to run into a little problem, which is highlighted in this theorem in the middle of the slide. And this, uh, the proof of the theorem is in the uh, position paper that I have there in the URL. And it basically says the following. If you have a pool which is viable, basically the resources are more than the cost, and also you have a pool which is cost efficient, which is the property you see on the right. And cost, efficiently, cost efficiency in English basically means that the cost per unit of stake of the pool is no worse than any of its subsets. So if you take a set of resource units, the cost per unit of resource is as good as any of its fragments, let's say. So if you are in such a situation, and it happens that omega, the set of all resources, has these uh, two properties, it's viable and it's cost efficient, then there is a centralized pooling configuration with a strong Nash equilibrium. And a strong Nash equilibrium here means that and a strong Nash equilibrium basically here means that even if a coalition is, is willing to deviate, um, then it's not going to gain anything. So the first thing that you want to ask about this is, are these two conditions of this, of this theorem um, like likely to happen? And then I'll give you an example here at the bottom um, that basically says that this actually happens uh, happens in a in a fairly in a fairly general way. And so I have. Can I interrupt you for a second? We have a question here um, in the Q and A. Is reward sharing is the reward sharing function a specific form of a Shapley value? Well, I mean, it. it could be related. It's something that I haven't thought about. Uh, but it could be related. Perhaps we can take this question on the conversation at the end. Great, thanks. So let's take this uh, property uh, that I call operator linear that basically says the following, that the cost of a pool is linear in the amount of resources plus some constant value. So this is kind of a standard thing, for example, in proof of work or proof of stake. 
right? You have some constant value of cost that you need in order to process, let's say, a set of transactions, let's say, without this total generality is constant, and then you have some effort that you have to put in order to, um, some effort that you have to put in order to do the proof of work, which is linear in the amount of resources. So it turns out that under this, con under this assumption, the set of all resources will be cost effective under a fairly reasonable condition. Basically, assuming that the differences in the linear uh, coefficient between the operators are less or equal than the transaction, than the flat costs. So basically this says once the flat costs become, become you know, somewhat, somewhat non negligible, somewhat substantial, this theorem would apply. So that's a negative result, as you understand. And furthermore, it's completely general. I mean, the assumptions, uh, you know, that this theorem relies are, are, are fairly, fairly, fairly standard and easy. It's not something specific to Bitcoin or anything like that. It's something that applies to all these resource-based systems. So we have to see what we can do. The centralized configuration is not very good. It's a single operator basically running the whole system. If you want to think about this, the resource-based system itself at decentralized equilibrium it becomes obsolete. In fact, it's better to throw it away and then run a centralized organization that has uh, shareholders, the people that are, uh, you know, participating in this uh, uh, pooling configuration and, and put as the operator the one that has the best cost. Of course, even in such case, this does not necessarily mean that the resource-based system was completely useless. It was the system that brought us here, right? So created this, uh, this, this configuration. Uh, nevertheless, it's more interesting to explore other ways um, that we can navigate away from this centralized result. So other better equilibria may exist and are more easily reachable. And in fact, what we may want to do is influence the system operation towards them. So, what is a good observation for this is that coordination for pooling has a cost. We can lower the cost to participate by introducing some on-chain pooling, for example. So, instead of having people pool outside the system, if you want, at the resource level, invite them in some as frictionless as possible manner to pull within the system. What is the advantage of this? The advantage if they pull within the system is that we have an opportunity to influence uh, the pooling towards a direction that can be better for the stability of the system to a decentralized configuration. And this is actually a nice distinction between bimodal and unimodal uh, reward functions. So a, a unimodal reward function is basically rewarding people for doing one thing, participating, while a bimodal or multimodal, if you want, is something that may allow uh, people to be rewarded for doing various different things. So for instance, in proof of many proof of stake systems, including Cardano, participants can be allowed to delegate their stake on chain or propose themselves as operators. So let me so come can, now to this. Can I ask yes. you about that? So I agree, delegation right, reduces the cost of participation, but was mm -hmm. it wasn't clear to me from your theorem that reducing the cost of participation will push you towards a different equilibrium. Is there, yeah. is there some intuition for that or? Um, well, I mean, the intuition here, I mean, I have an argument about this. I say hopefully or potentially, and then okay. and then I'll, okay. I'll come to, I'll come to argue about this. But I'm I'm, I'm just pointing this as a, as a possibility, right? So we have this bad equilibrium. Okay. The question is whether we can navigate away from it. And okay, and the thesis here is that by reducing the cost of of, of participation, uh, we might be able to go around that. But that's something that that remains to be to be argued. Okay, great. Thank you. So let me come now to this uh, work that we've done 
and has been used in, in Cardano among um, uh, most notably. Uh, this is joint work with Lan Brunius, Elias Kutsukias, and uh, Katerin Stuka. And it's a, a work that appeared uh, last year, um, or published last year, I should say, it was available for some time as a technical report. So that's a, a reward scheme, which is by model, as I mentioned. It has two parameters, K and alpha. In that system, prospective operators register themselves by declaring their operational cost and profit margin. They become committed to operate and provide rewards via a smart contract. And now stakeholders can delegate their stake to these operators that form these pools. And the delegated operator rewards are guaranteed by this smart contract. And this is another way that we remove the friction uh, in these pooling configurations. So the bimodal operation here again means that the stakeholders can take two actions on chain, declare and write a node, or delegate to a node. So let me come now to the semantics and the function of these parameters, k and alpha. So k controls the number of operators. And the, uh, the uh, plan here is that the incentives of the system should be tuned so that in a completely rational environment, there will be k operators that each one has delegated or total stake, one over k of the total available. On the other hand, the parameter alpha will provide protection against civil behavior. And I'll come to explain how this is done. But let me start with some more detail about how the K parameter works. So the K parameter is a soft cap on the operator size. So the K parameter will cap the operator's rewards so that they are linear up to a point that when the operator reaches the one over K of total resources, it will become flat afterwards. So it won't make sense for an operator or a pool to grow more than that. Now observe that if we were to mimic the Bitcoin operation, effectively this means that there's no soft cap. So K equals one. And what happens there is that you can very easily show that the system immediately centralizes to one pool. In fact, the real operation of Bitcoin, which is off, um, off chain, just exhibits a very small number of pools needed uh, to reach 51% of total resources controlled. And actually, there were times in the history of Bitcoin that there were there are pools that reached or exceeded the 50% barrier. Now, for values bigger than K, what we prove is that the system has an equilibrium of K equally sized pools. And the system converges to that, assuming with no externalities. I'll come to the effect of the alpha parameter actually in the next slide, but let me just tell you a little bit about what happens in the real world execution of this system in Cardano. The current setting is K equals 500. And the way that the pools have organized themselves, at least in June 21, you can see it in the bottom right diagram. So this basically shows you um, this uh, dotted horizontal line is the uh, saturation limit, the soft cap that I mentioned. and uh, uh, what you see in the blue uh, shaded part is the pools uh, starting from the one that is the largest going to the smallest. So as you see, the perfect equilibrium predicts a rectangle, which is uh, exactly at the saturation level. And what we have in the real game operation is something which is close to that. There is a, there's a long tail that is a triangle that is missing, let's say, from um, the um, upper right of the rectangle. The actual number of pools in Cardano is like close to more, like, more than 2,500 at the moment, with a, a very tiny amount of stake, of course, uh, at the very end of this tail. So if that's the K parameter, what's the alpha parameter doing? Now, think as an operator to understand what's the use of that. If you are in this soft cap environment and you say, I'm very popular, so, why should I just have one pool? I can make many. And this is a type of civil behavior. And it would be a civil behavior if you try to hide it, hide the fact that you're operating many pool, pools, or it can be like a, just a pool splitting behavior or a multiple pool behavior if you just do it openly. 
Now, of course, this, this is undesirable. If this happens, you may get K pools at equilibrium, but it turns out that there is the same entity that is controlling many of them. So we haven't achieved much. And this is where the alpha parameter comes into play. When you declare a pool, you can also pledge um, some stake with it. Now that's different than delegating. So pledging comes with a much bigger opportunity loss. The way our system is by model says the following. Delegation has almost no opportunity loss. You're not going to get bonded. You're not going to get friction. You can always move away from pool, but pledging has opportunity loss. So that's a fundamental difference between pledging and delegating. And pledging now is going to uh, create the following effect. It's going to make it, we, we will use it to increase the rewards for those pools that have a higher pledge. And this will make it less profitable to run many pools. So this is the first way that we can mitigate uh, this uh, type of simple attacks. Nevertheless, even though this alpha parameter, the bigger it is, the better it is for simple attack mitigation, it also increases the potential disparity between rich and poor operators. So poor operators at the onset, before they become successful, they will be at a disadvantage. So that's why, and that's the same thing we do in Cardano, we do not choose a very big alpha value, and we also rely on community filtering. So basically, users that delegate, they are informed about the downsides of civil attacks and running multiple pools, and they may choose themselves not to delegate to those pools. So this gives an idea about, uh, this graphic shows a little bit how the scheme works, the reward sharing scheme works. So the reward sharing scheme takes a, a, a pie, which is all the rewards, and splits them into two parts. The left is the gray part, and the right is the purple part. Now, every pool is going to get a slice from both parts. This is the blue uh, slices that you see. And all these blue slices will come together. They will cover the cost of the pool operator. The pool operator can slice another profit margin from that combined slice, which is the green part that you see on the upper right. And finally, the remaining blue part will go to the delegates. So that's how the system works. And um, I guess also subject, of course, to the condition that we said about this soft cap. Now, this is actually an explanation of the formula um, that uh, implements the graphic of the previous slide. It's not worth going into it right now because there is, you know, smaller details here that are important. Standing on the system, but this is the exact formula that determines the rewards of the pool. Perhaps the only thing I would like to point out here is that, as you see on the left side of this formula, there is a performance factor that multiplies the whole, the whole number of rewards that go to a pool. And this basically means that underperforming pools will have the rewards adjusted. So for instance, if your pool operator server goes down, the performance factor is going to be affected, and then you're going to start losing rewards. And if you lose rewards, you're going to lose delegates. And if you lose delegates, then your node is not going to be elected as often to run the protocol. And can I ask you just a question about implementation on this? So um, if you were in the proof of work setting, is there any effective method for sort of setting a K or implementing something like this? Like in the proof of stake setting, mm -hmm. you can always see what people's stakes are. Whereas yeah. in the proof of work setting, um, you don't really have a notion of people's hash power, except maybe yeah. by looking into the past at how much they were hashing. Yeah, that's an excellent question. Actually, we have... Um, we have spent uh, some time thinking about it. Um, it might be possible, but it's, it is tricky, exactly for the reason that you mentioned. So in other words, it's much, more, it's much easier to do something like this in a proof-of-stake system 
where you can have this recording that everything that happens on chain. Otherwise, in the proof of work system, you will have to monitor this in some other sort of less robust way. And I think it is possible, and we did have, and we do have a, uh, a design, but that's not something that we have explored much further. I think it's actually a very interesting question to see if a similar mechanism uh, with exactly the similar similar effect could be applied here. As I said, we have something, but still still not something that is that is published. Okay, thanks. And we have um, one question from the audience now, which is saying mm -hmm. as um, uh, you know, as throughput increases for scalable blockchains, we expect fees to be very low. And so we expect almost all of the operator rewards to be coming from um, block rewards, which generates an inflationary pressure. Um, and the question is, do you see this as an issue that block rewards and impose an inflationary um, cost for holding the cryptocurrency? Yeah, I mean, they do. And I think uh, this sort of inflationary pressure, I think it's completely fair game as part of the tokenomics of, of the system. Um, now, whether this sort of makes sense in a particular to tokenomic schedule or not, this is a big chapter. Um, and uh, I think essential for understanding the particular deployment of, of the system. So I guess like the, the answer here is that th there is no like sort of perfect answer here other than that, that this inflationary, uh, this in inflationary uh, sort of function, if you want, of the tokenomics component of the resource-based system is, is completely fair to be explored. And actually, a number of systems um, have such uh, a, or exploit such inflationary, um, such in such inflationary tokenomics. But, but this analysis essentially ignores inflation. Is that right? Oh, no, it doesn't. Okay. Oh, I see. Sorry. I didn't understand the, I didn't understand the question. No, no, it doesn't. Um, and perhaps I should explain why. Just give me one second. And thanks for clarifying. So the reward scheme, uh, the way it works is the following. It acts in an epoch-based fashion and looks at the whole epoch and says, these are the rewards that I have to distribute to the pools. And I'm doing the distribution based on the function or the formula, let's say, that you see depicted graphically here. The, but, the but value whole, R, let me just finish just this yep. point quickly. So the value R can be a pot or reward pot that is funded by inflation, taxation, transaction fees, you name it. This is determined by the tokenomics, let's say, component of the system that determines the supply, uh, the supply of the assets. And it's, not, it's independent, if you want, of the mechanism presented in this slide. So the, the, the formula that determines R can actually be based on inflation or be based on transaction fees or be based on other aspects like taxation or um, you know, similar other mechanisms. Does that make sense? Yes, so the, the total pot R is this, for this analysis, the total pot R is assumed to be fixed. And then yes. independently, you can choose how you fund R, whether it's just from inflation or from some other mechanism. Precisely. Okay, yeah. thanks. Precisely. So, so, so I should say like somehow the game that I'm exploring here is kind of the one shot game where, where basically it's one epoch and there is like one pot of rewards, but the real game is an iterated game that runs for many epochs following some schedule that determines this time series of, of R, but may also depend on the sort of the demand of the token, its actual value, and, and so forth. Okay, so just to give some examples now of how these rewards uh, work, um, or perhaps given that the time is a little bit tight, maybe actually I'll, I'll just run a little bit forward. Um, so here, here you can see some experimental analysis. That's from the uh, from the original paper. Um, so this is for ten stakeholders. Sorry, for hundred stakeholders and parameter value k. Now you can see an execution of our system at the top, and you can see these colored bands are the pools that are slowly created, and then the vertical bar is the equilibrium state. So you can see the system reached ten pools and stay stabilized there. Now at the bottom, you can see a Bitcoin line scheme that has no cap. And you can see there is one band that suddenly consumes everything, and that's the centralization 
uh, equilibrium at the end. So here you see a simulation of incentive-driven participation that gives you a hint about the Nash dynamics of that system. And it shows you that the system hits the um, sort of decentralized equilibrium. Now, this is another example from upcoming work that we do on the pool splitting phenomenon that basically says, let's take a simulation where you have multiple agents and, and the agents create multiple pools or perform this civil attack. And what you see actually interesting, interestingly, I will just point to the graph on the left. Again, we have 100 stakeholders with k equals 10. We have immediately at the beginning, the x-axis is time, a spike in the number of pools. So everybody creates pools because they, they want to sort of make as much as possible. And now because of the effect of the alpha parameter, they just realize that this is not as profitable as they hope. And now you can see like that this comes down. And in fact, the system again uh, finds an equilibrium at the optimal level, which is the 10 pools that we targeted. So, so here's an example that, that shows you how uh, the equilibrium works out in the pool splitting case. So just to summarize these properties, we have K equally sized pools, which is an equilibrium. All delegates at equilibrium receive the same rewards per unit of of stake. The alpha parameter creates this trade-off between cost efficiency and civil resilience. So the higher is the alpha parameter, the richer are the people you're going to find at the equilibrium state. And if you are very competitive as an operator, you will get more rewards. So basically, if you have a lower cost, you can get a higher profit margin. And what you can prove actually that is the cost declaration in that system is truthful in the sense of victory options. So this gives you a summary of these properties. Let me now wrap up in the next couple of minutes. So we have some time also for uh, discussion. So um, first of all, in a resource-based system uh, that, we saw, that we've seen here, um, there's four characteristics which um, I presented. Uh, resource-based participation, tokenomics, decentralized service provision, and reward sharing. And if you want these um, capture different angles or different aspects of these um, of these uh, systems, and they require actually expertise coming from different disciplines. We have cryptography and uh, protocol design on the left, and we have economics game theory on the right. Now, you might ask whether everything I told you today, because I started from information technology services and then I ended up discussing something about blockchain systems. Is this something that generalizes indeed to a number of different, uh, different systems? So here's a recipe for a state-based system. You decide on some parameters K and alpha, and you can use the same reward time scheme that I, that I presented to you in the previous uh, uh, slides. And you write the code of a smart contract that describes uh, this tokenomic schedule, like inflation or whatever else you think is consistent with the demand that you expect. And then you airdrop a number of coins, an initial distribution of coins, to a wide set of, of, of shareholders. For example, you can use an existing distributed ledger and do a so-called airdrop, just give to everyone that, that is there um, a certain amount of coins. Then you have to prepare a software code base that uses a suitable proof-of-stake blockchain. For example, the Ouroboros protocol is suitable for such an operation because it's capable of adjusting automatically, let's say, to various different levels of participation. And then the blockchain system will contain the smart contract code that will monitor the performance factors and will issue the rewards that are needed. And then, of course, your software code base should contain the decentralized uh, protocol implementation that's going to uh, run wh wh whatever service that you want to run. Then you just upload your software to any accessible website, you set the launch date, and then you're done. You can just uh, sit back and relax was the service will come out of nowhere and will become a global system, or of course, fail miserably. 
because you got something wrong. So can this happen or is it possible to launch such systems to do other things than just blockchain transactions? And here's an example with a joint work with Claudia Diaz and Harry Halpin of Nimtech, uh, of the Nimtech project. This is a mixnet system that offers sender anonymity and privacy preserving uh, message passing. So the objective of the system is to enable participants to self-register as mixed node operators, monitor operation collectively, provide rewards fairly based on the effort invested and penalize deviations. And this is a system that uses an extension of the reward sharing scheme, which I presented to you in the, in the previous slides. So if you're interested to learn more, uh, here is some links. For example, the position paper that I mentioned is at, is at the top, or you can see the full version of the Euro NCP paper, or you can see the NIM white paper. And with this, I'll um, uh, wrap up this presentation and I'm happy to take, uh, I'm happy to take uh, questions. So one question we have is, um, how did the different versions of the Ouroboros protocol differ? Um, yeah. So let me uh, just describe a little bit uh, here um, about that. Um, for the Ouroboros protocol, uh, we develop a proof of stake system which is general purpose and is compatible with various different transaction systems and uh, tokenomic schedules, um, as well as ledger rules. So the objective from the design was to try to um, capture in a formal sense within a properly defined mathematical model, the different um, uh, different threat models that are relevant in the setting. So, depending on the particular setting that you may want to implement or deploy the Ouroboros protocol, different threat models might be applicable. So, one of the reasons that uh, we developed different versions of the Ouroboros protocol it is, behold, it is because we um, wanted to explore different threat models. So, for instance, in a recent paper that we just published uh, at Eurocrypt 2021, was just uh, um, last month, called Uroboros Kronos, we explore how is it possible to run the Ouroboros protocol without any external dependency on a global concept of time. So the question that we ask there is that, is it possible to have a proof of stake protocol like Ouroboros with the same properties of the original Ouroboros uh, uh, paper, but operate without depending on an external concept of time? I mean, just for reference, the Bitcoin protocol requires an external uh, concept of time. So the question is that we ask here is that, is, is it possible for the blockchain protocol itself to be its own timekeeper? So it doesn't have any external time dependency. Instead, the question asked there is, if everybody has its own local clock, is it possible to get everyone's local clock and somehow synthesize via the protocol a global notion of time? Now, this is a question, for example, that we didn't ask in the original paper. So in the original paper, uh, we actually relied on an external concept of time. So that's why, for example, there is this version now, Ouroboros Kronos. Now, in another paper, Ouroboros Crypsinus, we explored the question, is it possible to protect the privacy um, of the stakeholders? The proof of stake systems, proof of stake itself says you have to say something about your assets. Is it possible to hide that? So I'm just saying like there are different threat models and we have different versions of Ouroboros to capture these different threat models. Now a specific protocol deployment, let's say like Cardano, for instance, will cherry pick these particular, uh, these particular versions 
And this is what we've done in Cardano and just sort of extrapolate an optimal um, variant given the constraints and the threat model of the particular setting. I hope this uh, explains um, the and can I ask, yeah, go ahead. Um, can I ask you, so you have this parameter K, which is sort of the target number of pools or the target number of uh, you know, block producers, if you think of this. Uh, how Have you thought about the dynamics in these kind of delegated proof of stake systems? So I know people have, um, you know, negative views of things like EOS and Tron sometimes, but just in terms of the mechanism EOS, for example, has a mechanism where you delegate to stakeholders and they have actually like a very fixed value of K. The top 21 um, people who have the most delegations, right, get a very different reward than everybody below them. And so this doesn't have any direct mechanism for um, making these pools equal, but it basically fixes that sort of on this definition that there will be always 21 pools in this kind of type of mechanism. And then you could potentially add some incentive on top of that to then try to balance those pools. Have you thought about that direction of a... Um... Yeah. Well, actually, this is a very good question, actually. Um, and, and it really depends on the, or also on the underlying protocol. So if you have an underlying protocol that, you know, really requires um, a small number of nodes. So for example, a lot of standard uh, BFT style, as they call Byzantine fault tolerance consensus protocols, in the literature, they don't scale well with a large number of nodes. So in that case, if you want to keep performance reasonable, uh, what you have to do is like fix a very low value of K. And then you can do something like you said. So you can say like, I just uh, pick the best 21, let's say the ones that got the most votes. The problem with a system like that is that you have a very substantial amount of signal. By signal here, I mean the delegations that happen just at the 22 level and down, that it gets lost. And this is, a, and this is like suboptimal from the point of view of uh, getting the maximum you, what you can out of delegation. I mean, one of the aspects here of that delegation can be useful is that you get signal from the community about who is worth um, running the, or supporting the system. Now, what happens, let's say, with the Ouroboros protocol is that it is possible, for instance, to use any number of underlying stakeholders, 500, 1,000, you know, 1 million, it doesn't matter. So, so the nice thing is that we can utilize this full tail in the protocol, but we just, but we just choose to set K equals 500 because we want to avoid this super fragmentation of the system because high fragmentation of the system, let's say 1 million people like all of them tiny, may not provide good quality of service. So it's good to have some level of aggregation, but you don't need to go all the way down to 21, if that makes sense. Okay, thanks. Um, and do you have a minute to review it, uh, to revisit this question about um, the Shapley value? Um, is this reward sharing function um, uh. So, yeah, so I, I would say no, um, but I think it's like it's a, it's a direction that's worth exploring. I'm not sure actually perhaps it would be good to take, take it in conversation okay. uh, just to make the connection. I think there was another question, but actually disappeared. Oh, yeah, the, the CBDC. Actually, I thought it was a good question, actually. Uh, I see it's, it's dismissed. Yeah. <laughs> but I thought actually it was a really good question. Okay. Um, so, and, and the reason I think it's a good question is that in CBDCs, when I, so it's not immediately connected here, obviously, because there's a centralized, there's a centralized authority that runs the system. Um, but, but it's still legitimate to ask other questions um, related to CBDCs. So, for example, you can think of a CBDC, uh, a centrally banked digital currency system, um, as a system that has many um, uh, many components, and then you can ask, is it possible some of these components to become uh, resource-based systems, right? So, of course, it will not centralize, it will not centralize the, um, um, the uh, we will not decentralize necessarily the central bank itself, 
even though some people like uh, find this also an appealing uh, an appealing direction. Um, but we may want to uh, perform resource-based implementation for various other components that are related to the CBDC system. So, for example, like what, what about the component that uh, asks for um, regulatory compliance, for instance? Uh, this could, could be a system that uh, you could develop in a sort of decentralized resource-based fashion. Just, just to give an example. So, um, I think once you understand this uh, resource-based uh, um, resource-based uh, approach to systems, it's actually an interesting question to think what type of systems um, are um, sort of good candidates to accept such an implementation. Okay, thanks. Um, so um, I wanna thank you for this um, really interesting presentation.